G'day folks, welcome to my first C++ tutorial. Alright, let's get started. Okay, so just a little bit of history first of all. Uh, in the early 1970s there was a guy called Dennis Ritchie. This is him just over here. And uh, he invented a computer language called C. And this was a really fast and simple language. It was easy to read and quick to code in. That's as opposed to assembly languages anyway. And today, his language is absolutely everywhere. Uh, massive, massive influence on programming languages. And uh, yeah, this guy is actually one of the most important uh, people in all of computing history. The mighty Dennis Ritchie. Anyway, a short while after, uh, or at the same time, there was another idea that was being invented, and that was uh, object-oriented programming. Now, the C language didn't have any of these extensions, the object-oriented extensions. Uh, but another guy, this guy here, Mr. Bjorn Strustrup, uh, come up with another language called C++, uh, which is basically just the, the original C language, but uh, it also has object-oriented extensions. So this is what we'll be uh, learning. It's an incredible language, and it's pretty much got all of the original C language in it, plus lots of object-oriented extensions. We'll get into what object oriented is uh, later on. But uh, yeah, so by learning C++, we're also learning uh, the language C. They're, yeah, they're not different. So C++ is sort of a C with a few extra extensions. Okay, so that's enough of the history anyway. Um, C++ is a compiled language, which means that we'll be making native executable files, which can be run by Windows. And because it's compiled, it's much faster than scripting languages or other languages that run with virtual machines. So C Sharp and Java, uh, they run with what's called virtual machines. And they're slower, so uh, the CPU not only has to translate the uh, C Sharp and Java code into its native uh, assembly, but uh, yeah, it has to run that as well. So it's, it's very slow. But C++ is very fast compared to these two compiled languages. Okay, so I'll be using Visual Studio 2010 and probably 2012, since that's just about to come out, uh, as my IDE. IDE is short for Integrated Development Environment, and this makes programming in C++ very, very easy. Uh, usually, you'd have to uh, write out a text document yourself, then save it as, say, you know, myprogram.cpp, and then from the command line, you'd have to compile it yourself and, you know, link all of the object files and all of this nonsense. But uh, Visual Studio turns all of this into a one-button affair. You hit F5 and Visual Studio will do all of the compiling and then run your program to test it. So the general flow of uh, programming in C++ is that we type C++ code into a normal text file in Visual Studio 2010. It's got a little text editor there in it. Uh, then we try to run the compiler on the text file. That's when we hit F5. And that'll produce an .exe file for us uh, in the background in some directory where our project is set up. And if there's any errors, Visual Studio will let us know, if there's any syntax errors, that is. And uh, I should say, actually, the syntax of a, of a programming language is just the grammar. Yeah, the syntax of C++ is, is the grammar of C++. It's the rules of C++. So, yeah, if there's any typos or things like that, Visual Studio won't compile the .exe. It'll tell us that there's a typo, and we can go back and fix it. And if there's no typos or syntax errors, then we end up with an .exe file, and uh, or .exe, I think some people call it, executable file, pretty much, just a Windows application. And, uh, yeah, Visual Studio will then run that, and we can see if it's got any runtime bugs. That's bugs that we can find while it's running. Maybe there's some logic bugs, or maybe we've divided by zero, or something like that. Uh, anyway, we fix those bugs and we repeat ad infinitum, or until we're happy with our program. So the whole process of software development is a fine art. Yes, that's quite true. Uh, the only way to get better is to practice. So, yeah, on top of reading books and, and watching tutorials, you really just have to practice. Um, programmers program for hours and hours and hours, and uh, that's why they're able to do what they do. And uh, without those hours and hours of practice, you really can't get anywhere. So 
Yeah, I suggest when you're watching these tutorials or other tutorials, you sit down with your IDE, Visual Studio, or whatever you're using, and you just practice. Just type, you know, C++ code, test everything out, and uh, change it, see how it all works. Okay, that's good. Where do we start? Okay, what would a computer say if it could talk? I think it would say hello. This is going to be our first program, folks. And uh, anybody who's learned other programming languages will probably know exactly what this program's going to do. Here we go. The almighty hello world. Uh, this is the C++ code over here. So we've got to include IO stream, int main, etc, etc, etc. We type this into Visual Studio. Um, we'll do this at the end of the tutorial as a uh, demonstration. But um, yeah, for now we'll just step through each line so that when we type it out we can get through it fairly quickly. So that's the whole program just there, a simple hello world. It does nothing but print hello world to a, a black console window. And then it waits for us to hit a key and then it closes. Okay, let's go line by line. We'll have a bit of a look at these things. Uh, the first line, include IO stream. This is what's called a preprocessor directive. And the, uh, the processor is the compiler, pretty much. And the preprocessor is what happens before the compiler compiles our exe file. So, yeah, the triangle brackets are less than and greater than, and um, often used as that in C sharp. Yeah, they're often used as brackets as well, along with being less than and greater than symbols. So the include directive takes all of the C++ code from an external file, which is IO stream just here, uh, that somebody else has written over at Microsoft or, you know, whoever. And uh, this is called a header file. Uh, later on, we'll write our own header files. But um, IO stream is short for input output stream. And uh, this file includes code for things like this C out down here and this end all, end line, uh, along with C in, so that we don't have to write our own routines for uh, printing stuff to the console window. Okay, the file IO stream contains, yes, we just said that. Uh, all right, the next line. Oh, you might notice that there's white space in here. There's a space just there. Uh, C++ usually ignores all white space, so we could have had, uh, you know, this int main on the line before just here. But, uh, yeah, I chose to space it down here. Anyway, this is the starting point of our program. Every program needs a place to start and traditionally it's called the main function. You can actually change the name of it, but it's not a good idea, at the start anyway. But uh, you can call it whatever you want in the end. Uh, for now, by default, uh, Windows is going to look for the main function. So when you click on your compiled exe, uh, Windows runs the function called main, and if there's no function, the file will refuse, no, the compiler will refuse to make an exe file. Star. Well, yes. <laughs> Yeah, we just said that. You can change it. But anyway. Uh, everything else in your program branches from this single starting point. Yeah, so from main, uh, you can branch to as many different things as you want. You know, you can um, multi-thread and get your other cores going, or you can call different functions and procedures. But uh, it all starts from main. Okay, so programming is all about taking shortcuts. And uh, you'll see this again and again. This is really one of the powerful things about object-oriented programming: is the shortcuts that allows us uh, that it allows us to take. And a function is just a block of code that we can call or execute. It's called uh, over and over again using its name instead of having to retype the code. So here we're actually only calling this once. Every time the exe is run, uh, the main function gets run. But we can make our own functions, say maybe we've got a square root function that returns the square root of a value, and we don't have to type the code for calculating the square root over and over again. Uh, we can just call the square root function by name, and it'll give us a square root. Does that make sense? I don't know. Uh, functions begin with a definition, and that's what this line here is. int main open and close brackets or braces or parentheses, and function definitions start with what the function gives back to the caller. Uh, the caller is the bit of code that calls the function or asks the function to run. So in this particular case, and main is sort of by itself in this uh, way, um, the caller is Windows. Uh, usually the caller will be some other 
function inside your program, but uh, in this case the caller is Windows. And we return an int. Int is short for integer. That means that main returns to its caller uh, a whole number. Um, yeah, no decimal places in an int. Uh, the caller will be Windows. Yeah, we said that. The int function went through if there was a problem running the program. Yeah, usually you return 0, which we've got down here, return 0. If everything went OK, you return to Windows 0. If something happened, then you return negative 1 or 1 or 150. Uh, you return an error code, which you get to define. So you might say in your program uh, documentation that, you know, uh, if the program returns 150, then it means there was a divide by 0 error. That sort of thing. But um, there's not going to be any errors here, so we're just returning zero. Uh, after the return type in the function definition, we have the function's name. Yeah, so this, this function here is called main. Very good. This is followed by a list of parameters in parentheses. Uh, as you can see, these parentheses are empty, so uh, main takes no parameters. So if you're making something like a square root function, as we were talking about before, uh, that might take an int, it might take a number in the parameters. So you put that in the brackets here, but, you know, main doesn't take any. It can take some, but we'll get into that later. This version doesn't take any. Uh, yeah, we'll get to know functions very well later on. Okay, so the next thing, these are, this is paired. The next line we see is an open curly brace. And this open curly brace is paired to this closed curly brace down here. And the curly braces are always in pairs, and they specify a code block. So this particular code block that they're specifying here, because these uh, open and curly braces come straight after the main uh, definition, uh, these ones define the body of main. Or they define the block of code that the computer is to run when main is executed. Okay, so next we have the most complicated line of all in our program. Uh, std, colon, colon, c out, less than, less than, etc, etc, etc. This is the most complicated line, and this is the line that actually prints hello world to the console screen. std is short for standard, meaning standard input and output, and this is a namespace that we got from uh, include at ing, the io stream file above. I think include hasn't got an e in it, including hasn't got an e in it, but anyway, uh, io stream defines std. And an, uh, sorry, a namespace. Uh, in C++ we can have many things called the same name. So we could have multiple things in our C++ file called C out, for example. We'll get into what C out is in a minute. Uh, and this leads to the problem that, you know, if you have to refer to a specific uh, version of C out, say, um, you know, how do you differentiate it from the other ones? And you differentiate it with a namespace. So std is the namespace just here. And you can think about a namespace as uh, similar to, well, this is, this is sort of how I picture it anyway. If there's a room full of people and all of the people are called Tony, and you want to specify an exact Tony, it doesn't have to be Tony, it can be anything. <laughs> uh, but you might have to say where he's from. So you could say, well, the Tony from Melbourne or the Tony from Sydney. And uh, this would help you specify exactly which Tony you mean. And the city just here, the Sydney or Melbourne, is the namespace. So what we're saying here is um, the C out from STD. Good stuff. Okay, C out means console out, and it's the output to the console, logically, uh, the text that's written to the screen. Uh, the console is a black DOS-like screen. I don't know if you remember DOS from uh, the 80s and the 90s. It was a really cool operating system, I think. But um, we don't have DOS anymore, but Windows has got a console screen, so yeah, that's what we're using. Usually you don't write uh, console programs. Usually, you know, Windows form programs and that, they don't use the console, but um, we'll start with a console program because they're simple. Okay, so these two less than symbols are actually the most confusing part of this entire program. Yeah, the two less than symbols just here, there's no space in between. Uh, these are called the insertion operator, and they insert whatever is to the right of them to whatever is to the left. So C out just here is to the left, and hello world is to the right, so this is going to insert the string hello world into the stream 
uh, console output. And the reason that I think they're confusing is that they're actually uh, an overloaded operator. And then I've got, yeah, it, I don't know if anybody else has noticed, but um, to me, uh, overloading the insertion operator here is a bit odd, and the rest of C++ doesn't tend to look this strange. Yeah, I don't know. It's not that weird, you get used to it anyway. Uh, the next thing that we see is what's to be inserted to C out. Yep, we just said that's the insertion operator just there. So uh, this is what's to be inserted, and it's a string. You can tell it's a string because it's surrounded by double quotes, just like that. Um, Visual Studio paints our strings red, colors them red, make them easy to see. And there's a couple of different types of string in C++, and this one's probably the most basic. This is actually just a um, series of characters, exactly as it looks. Plus, there's an invisible zero at the end, so C out knows when to stop printing the characters. Anyway, strings are surrounded by double quotes. And the last thing that we see, and this is really important actually, uh, the last thing that we see is a semicolon. All statements in C++ finish with a semicolon. Yeah, how embarrassing. I do that all the time. And what... Are, oh, yeah. Okay, so C++ doesn't care about new lines. Uh, we could type this hello world down here on the next line down here. And put the semicolon after that. And C++ would be just as happy if it looked like that. Uh, C++ knows when the statement is over because of the semicolon, not the new line. Okay, so the next line starts with another reference to the STD namespace, but this time we're not saying the C out from STD, we're saying C in, which is the console input. And this is the keyboard, pretty much. Uh, this is going to get one character from the keyboard. And we're doing this because uh, otherwise our program would just flash up on the screen and then close straight away, which is no good. So this, this line just here waits for you to press enter on the keyboard before the program closes. Yeah, we just said that. We call uh, the full stop period means the same thing as that. Yeah, it does too. Just here, we'll get into this a bit later, but we're saying... Um, Tell C in from the STD namespace to get a character, pretty much. Yeah, that's what the dot to C means. Uh, get is actually a function too, so we're calling a function just here. And get takes no parameters, so the uh, parentheses just here are empty. And once again, we've got a semicolon on the end. And finally, the last line of our code is return zero. Uh, we promised at the top that main would return to the caller an integer, int, and we have to do that at the bottom, return zero. And like we said, that means all good. Usually you uh, return zero if no problems occur during the running of the program. Okay, so yeah, long story short. Wait for key, yep. Okay, that's good. So let's get coding. Uh, the first thing I want to go through is how to get the IDE. So if you come to your uh, web browser, we'll download Visual Studio Express or Visual C++ Express. Uh, Visual, Visual Studio 2010 Express. Okay, so I'm using Firefox here, but you can obviously use whatever you want. And I'll open that one. Just the first one in Google. So this is this is the uh, page that you come to, and it's right here, Visual C++ 2010 Express. You've got a few options here. You can download Visual C Sharp. That's an excellent language as well. Uh, Visual Basic or Visual Web Developer. But for this tutorial series, we're looking at Visual C++. So we'll click on this one, and it takes you to here. And if we click Install now, uh, we get the option to download a little web installer. So save that to a safe place, and uh, once it's downloaded, that's only 3.2 megs, uh, you double click on that, and that downloads the rest of the program. So Visual C++ is actually a lot bigger than 3.2 megs. But uh, yeah, that should be pretty easy to do. 
Okay, so once you've uh, downloaded and installed that uh, Visual C++ IDE and you run it, you'll get something like this. This is Visual C++ Express 2010. Uh, you probably won't have any recent projects over here. This is just me messing about. Uh, yeah, but let's let's get started, shall we? So the first thing that you want to do with Visual C++ 2010 Express, and this is really important, is that you want to activate your product. Uh, unless you activate it... Did I mention that this was all free? I should have. Microsoft gives this away for free. It's really, really good IDE, and it gives it away for free. And anything that you make with the Visual C++ 2010 Express, you're free to distribute and sell. Excellent. Really, really cool. Uh, anyway, we're talking about activating the product, so let's let's go into help, and you come down here to register product. Click on that, and mine's already registered, but you should see here some sort of a I don't know a box or something where you can um, give Microsoft your email and register your product. It's all pretty self-explanatory, but just follow the links or follow the uh, instructions, and make sure that you activate your product. Otherwise, it will run out after 30 days, and you can't use it ever again. Good stuff. Close. Okay, so we'll get to coding. We'll go File, New, and Project, and we'll code what we just saw in the uh, previous example. So after going New Project, you get... Hold on a second. Somebody's come to visit me. All right, where were we? Um, okay, so we're making a new project. Uh, we've got a few options here, but if you select General in the... Uh, left hand box and empty project up here we're going to start from scratch today and the other thing that you've got to do is name your project so down here in the name box it's got enter name we're just going to call this maybe shoot one uh, you can call it whatever you want and click OK and here we go so this is Visual Studio here and this is our brand new project called shoot one uh, a few things that you might want to look out for are the toolbox and the solution explorer as well as the output window. Uh, I think the toolbox actually starts over the right hand side and the solution explorer starts over the left. I'm not sure. Anyway, the toolbox contains all tools and things, so when we're making Windows Forms, that's got all buttons and we can just drag and drop those onto our Windows Form. And the solution explorer lists all of the files that are in our project. So at the moment there's just a few empty directories and that's about it. So you can keep those or delete those directories, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, if we come to our Solution Explorer and we find the uh, the project name that we typed in just a minute ago, mine's called Toot1. If we right-click on that, we're going to add a C++ file. So we come down here to Add, and we go New Item, and here we've got the different files that we can add to our project. So we don't want to add a Windows form. What we want to add is a C++ file, .cpp. So select that. Uh, you might have to select Visual C++ in the uh, left-hand box over here, but that's what we're after, a CPP file. And once again, we've got to give it a name. So I'm going to call mine main.cpp because it's the main uh, code file to my project. You can call it whatever you want, but it's usual to call this one main.cpp. Anyway, once you've chosen a name, we click Add. And here we go. So this is the text editor just here. Uh, just a perfectly normal text editor. Exactly the same as a notepad, pretty much. Only this one's got sort of a spell checker for C++ code. Makes things really easy. Okay, so let's type, type the program that we had before. I don't know if I mentioned, but endl is uh, end line. Yeah, that just uh, moves the cursor in the console window down to the next line. We'll see that in a minute. There we go. So once we've typed that in, whoops. Yeah, that's better. Uh, once we've typed that in, we can uh, test our program for errors. And we can do that in a couple of ways. Uh, we can click the little green play button or you can go up to debug in the file menu and hit uh, start debugging just there well the easiest way is just to hit F5 we hit F5 and we start seeing the uh, 
compiler down here give us some messages. Tells us when we started building the project. Okay, here we go. And I'll just change that to a slightly bigger font so we can see what's going on. There we go. So this black window just here is the console window, and it's done exactly what we said. It printed hello world to the screen. And we can see now that the cursor is on the line underneath that. Uh, if we didn't have std uh, end line here, uh, the cursor would be up here beside the exclamation mark. Anyway, I just put that in just to show you guys some... Uh, yeah, end line. And then, of course, it's waiting for me now to hit enter before the program closes. So if I hit enter, the program closes, and it's all good. It returns zero to the uh, operating system or Windows. Now we can see down here, actually, the, uh, the program exited with the code 1. If we change this to, say, 3, and we run that, and then we hit enter, it says down here the program has exited with a code 3. Anyway. Uh, okay, one more thing that I wanted to show you guys was... Um, we said before that include IO stream uh, grabs the stuff in IO stream and dumps it there as if you'd written it yourself. Uh, if you right click on IO stream, you've got the choice there to open document IO stream. And if we select that, we see the code that's actually getting dumped into our program as if we'd written it ourselves. This is the IO stream C++ file. Very cool. And you'll see at the top of that, it's actually got its own include directive, include iStream. So once again, we can open iStream and have a look at what that's got in it. That's all there. So all of this code is being dumped into our program as if we'd written it ourselves. Very cool. Okay, well that's about all that I wanted to go through. So thank you for listening and see you later.